Hugh Bowman, welcome, mate. Simon, what a privilege. Now Thanks you know you've made it. <laughs> True. Hey, what, what an honour. What do people refer you to now? World champion jockey, Hugh Bowman, or Winx's rider, Hugh Bowman? Uh, certainly Winx's rider is high up there. I rarely get referred to as world champion jockey. I guess I did a little bit when I, when I was the leading, long jeans leading jockey in the world, mm. um, 2017, but uh, Frankie Dettori has since regained that mantle, and yeah, but it wasn't really something that sat that comfortably with me anyway, to be honest. World champion jockey though, like a young fella that grew up Dunny Do with your ma and your pa and Jim and Mandy and that lived on a bit of property. You're now 39 years of age. Two years ago you get voted world champion jockey. Did, was that a surreal feeling to fly on a plane over the other side of the world and accept that trophy? Yeah, it was, Simon. I, it was... Yeah, yeah, I didn't think a lot about it, I guess, really, but I mean, obviously that came off the back of Winx's amazing career and it's interesting how the voting is done. I mean, obviously they picked the top 100 Group 1 races mm. uh, or they nominate 100 Group 1 races as the top 100 and the voting's done on that system and of course I had Winx win sort of eight, eight, eight races. Yeah seven group ones yeah. and then she came back and won them the next year so it gave me a little bit of a saloon passage into the point scoring but yep. uh, apart from that though I had a great, I think I had two or three group one winners in Hong Kong and of course the Japan Cup at the end of the year so mm. it was an amazing year for me and uh, I'll never forget it. I mentioned you're 39 years of age, do you have time to reflect or are you just too busy because of seven days a week race riding um, and riding a, wear lo a mare like Winx? Uh, you don't really get the time to reflect? Is it as simple as that? Forget yesterday, move on to the next day? Well, I'm very much someone who looks forward, not backwards anyway. Mm. Uh, but I did take time, as we all know, after Winx's retirement, I took two months off, which I'm pleased I did. And that did give me time to reflect not only on Winx, but on myself and on my family. And I think, um, you know, there was sacrifices made from myself and those closest to me over the last four years for that success to be able to happen. And, um, you know, we might get into it later in the show, but that's one of the reasons the Japan Cup win was, you know, very, very special to me. Yeah, we will. We'll dive into Winx a little bit later on. But you started your uh, apprenticeship with the Billy Asfros at, uh, at uh, Bathurst. Uh, 97, you kicked in. Were you a natural jock? No, I wasn't. Very far from it. I was a natural horseman. I was a natural rider. I'd ridden uh, my whole life since before I can remember. I did pony club from before school up until the age of 15 and well, up until the age I started race riding really. At, mm. um, at the age of, well I was, got my amateur licence when I was 15 in the school holidays and fortunately my parents had, it, well, the old man in particular had a little bit of a, an association with Billy Asbros through, through the days of when Neil Mully was training, and uh, Billy used to ride for my grandfather and my father, and uh, his wife Leanne trained, of course, and was a leading trainer in the central districts at the time. So, yeah, I was fortunate enough to be given the opportunity to go and work with them, and having Billy as a mentor and a guide was instrumental. Uh, in my development as a jockey because as I said it was very unnatural to me because I'd never had really any any experience yeah, yeah. in the professional side of horse racing. How good was it to go as fast as you could when you're a young fella on a thoroughbred horse when they absolutely take control and bolt with you but you can learn so much in those experiences. Do you remember the first time you galloped one and let it rip and you thought I, oh the, the adrenaline. The, the first time was actually in the paddock uh, at Marothery uh, with the old man and yeah, I didn't quite know what I was in for to be honest when um, we, we, we went around. We'd done a fair bit of half pace together but we'd never really let one go and mm. yeah, I'll never actually forget that, the wind going through the skull cap and yeah. it, was a bit, it was a bit frightful to be honest but... Um, You'd left the old man had you? He was, he was distant? Well, he sort of went off before me, so my horse oh. chased him. So, oh, yeah. but I wasn't quite ready for the experience. I was about to, yeah. Um, yeah, I was about to go through. But it was something that 
certainly got my adrenaline going and still does today. Who'd you love? Who'd you love growing up? Well, you've got to have role models to emulate the way we want to go about it. Um, and oh, you get your first pair of jotties, you get your new helmet, then all of a sudden you ride in trials as an apprentice. Then you get your ticket. Who are you sitting back on the couch just waiting to have that first day at the races and watching and going, geez, I'd love to be that jockey winning big races? Uh, Darren Biedman. Yeah, no. Darren Biedman and Billy Aspros. Um, when I was in Bathurst. Uh, but before I started my apprenticeship, uh, Darren and Shane Dye were dominating yep. the group ones. Slipper. Mm. And they were the two that really captured my attention. Yeah. What was it about Beeman that you loved? Uh, just, the, just his strength mm. and his consistency. Yeah. But as I said, as a 14, 15 year old, I wasn't really paying attention like I would these days, but I guess the success and the fact that he and Shane had just commanded the best rides and it was just tit for tat mm. as to who got on the best one and they almost took it in turns Couple weekly. Of yeah, Beeman left hand, right hand. Slipper used to ride a little bit short, irons up, knees underneath the chin, he had the flowing hair, the Billy Idol look. Yeah, was I like... wasn't as attracted to the short iron, you yeah. know, really high, uh, the way Shane rode as opposed to Darren um, because it for me, it just seemed a little unnatural, but uh, yeah. he's a Hall of Famer and he was very effective at it, but for me personally, mm. it was something that I couldn't see myself emulating. You ride with your foot in the iron, Huey. A lot of the guys ride with the ball of their toe, so that's my, that's my foot. The ball of the iron goes across the ball of their toe, and that's their, that's their foot. You would like to ride with your foot right in, why is that? Uh, well, I, to be honest, when I started, I was made to do that. Mm. But that's how Billy rode, and that's how Darren rode too in the early days. Yeah. Uh, I think he ended up riding with his toe in the line towards the end. But certainly when I started, he had his full foot in the line. But uh, I was well, I was instructed in no uncertain terms to ride my full foot in the line, and that's exactly what I did. And when I moved to Sydney, I, after being two successful years in Bathurst with mm. uh, Leanne and Billy, we moved to Sydney and I thought, oh, this is my chance to develop into one of the big boys. So I started riding my yeah. toe in the iron and I had a horse stumble. It was oh. horse of Tiger Hollands actually, but it just stumbled at the 400 metre mark at Randwick and of course I went straight over its head and I truly believe if I had my full, full foot in the iron, I wouldn't have fallen off it. So Wait. after about six weeks on the sidelines, I, for memory, a month or six weeks, hmm. I'd hurt my knee. but. When I came back, I put my foot back in and I've never changed. Right, that was it. That suits you and your style. You say you moved from the country to the city. It's a big, big landscape change for you and fast, hard. But um, 2019, year 1999, I should say, in 2000, those racing seasons, in two years of your apprenticeship, you became leading apprentice. You must have had great opportunities, but made the most of it. Well, I had a great opportunity and I had a great grounding. You know, I'd ridden over 100 winners in the country. Mm. Uh, I came down to Sydney to Ron Quinton in Gun. in Ronnie. June 99, as I said, or as you just said. Mm. And I had a great deal of experience behind me. I had no country claim and no provincial claim, and I had a three kilo claim in the city. Mm. Uh, now, I was the beneficiary of a uh, system change with the apprentices. Mm which split the categories up to country, provincial and city. So I regained a three kilo allowance in the provincials mm. and obviously sustained the three kilo claim in the country. So that, that gave me another 80 winners with a claim that I wouldn't have had, well, I didn't have when I initially moved to Sydney. So mm. that, that really opened the door for opportunity for me. And yeah, I think I rode at the provincial Saturday meetings, Kemmler and Newcastle for five or six weeks uh, once we got started in the 99 season mm. and I think I rode three three trebles and two doubles and then of course the, Crazy. the big boys went to Melbourne and yep. my opportunity in the, in Sydney came and we had a great season winning the pre, uh, Apprentices title with 60 odd winners I think. You might be able to help this uh, uh, answer this question. Why do we put Apprentices on more in Victoria and not in Sydney? Uh, I think the system's a bit different in that the, you've got more dominant trainers in Sydney. That was even the case back then. You had Waterhouse and Hawks dominating. Yep. 
so if it suited them to use an apprentice, they would. But mm. you know, they tended to use their jockeys, um, and that same sort of dominance has continued on in Sydney with uh, a smaller number of trainers dominating. But also, the reality is the apprentices system in Victoria is far better than New South Wales, and I yeah. think as much as racing New South Wales has gone ahead in every area, mm. that's one area that um, that I, I know the boards um, are working on, but it yeah. certainly needs attention. With success comes a lot of uh, blowflies in racing. Blokes want to know your business, they want to get around you. Uh, money starts to flow in. Your leading apprentice, here we Bowman's out riding his claim really quickly, you become a superstar, then a social light takes over. How hard is it to adjust to uh, livelihood and social life when you're a young man? I th it's a difficult one, and it's, I think it's everyone's got to go through it their, in their own individual way, but mm. the best way to cope with it is to be busy. <laughs> Yep. You know, and if you're working hard, and I, I was very driven as a youngster. I still am, obviously. Yeah. Uh, I was very driven and I was very focused. And as you said, I, success came my way. I didn't ever really see myself as a superstar and I still don't, but... Um, Humble. Well, I am who I am. I do what I do. And yep. like I say, I'd prefer to look forward at what I might be able to achieve and, and look back and think what I have achieved. There'll be plenty of time in years to come for yeah, that. But as a young man, you've got to have a balance. You've got to get out and you've got to go and enjoy yourself. I mean, when you, you get your car licence when you're 18, you, you start having an alcoholic drink, all that sort of stuff. And then, Huey, I want to touch on 2002 because it was a life changer for you. Yep. You get caught with a positive swab. Yep. You come back, that absolutely changes your life uh, for an illicit drug. Mm. Well, tell it, share that moment with us. Well, I, how did you get yourself in a position? Well, I guess it just one thing led to another. I was, you know, I guess I've always been someone that's, uh, you know, likes to push the boundaries and, you know, like to have fun, like, like everybody else. And yep. Anyway, I, I, I dabbled into things I probably shouldn't have. Anyway, one thing led to another, and eventually, you know, I was. I, Looking back on it, it was probably a blessing that I got caught because I think, mm. you know, life was starting to go very fast and although I was uh, living a, you know, I was probably living a double life, I was partying all weekend and wor yeah. working all week. And Not on your own there, yeah. By the end of the week, I was sort of ready to cut the shackles off and rip in again and that happened, I think, for two or three months consecutively. Mm. And, you know, I think, looking back on it, had I not sort of, if things hadn't happened the way they did, things could have really spiralled out of control. But mm. did you think you were going to get away with it? Like you could oh, test it, you were testing not it. Not really. You thought you knew the system, didn't. and it was just a, that, that blessing in disguise was that you got caught. Or no, I never really thought about getting caught. To be perfectly right. honest, Fair you enough. know, I yeah. didn't feel like I was cheating the system. I didn't feel like I was, you know, I was just having fun. You know, yeah. I wasn't. There was nothing manipulative about how I was thinking of and what I was doing. It was just. Mm. It's a long time ago too, mind you, but yeah. Yeah, what I was you just, most about it? I was having fun. With the straighten up. I yeah. think you cop six months. I'll be honest, what I learnt when I when I was suspended, uh, six month suspension, uh, I was in about February. Yeah. For memory, I I went home and I watched the autumn carnival uh, from the lounge room in Dunny Do and what I learnt was for the first time, I could look at myself and say, well, I can be a top 10 city jockey. No doubt about it. Oh. I'd never thought that about myself until that stage. I'd always, I was always pushing and, Light as I said, I was driven to be better all the time. And I never, I don't think I ever gave myself the, the pat on the back or, or the understanding that I really was good enough. All I had to do was keep turning up and doing the work and yep. in time uh, that success would take care of itself but mm. if nothing else I learnt that I was good enough to be where I wanted to be and I also took time to go and work in North Queensland on a cattle station a good friend of mine from home took me up there and yep. uh, although under the although the circumstances weren't something that were ideal mm. the fact that I had the opportunity to go and do something outside of racing having given four or five years of my life, mm. basically everything I had to, to the sport, 
uh, it was a great leveller for me to just come back into racing having had that time away. It was a reset. It was. You watched jockeys riding your horses, winning big races in the autumn, and you knew you could do it. So you wanted to come back, mouth guard in, Hugh Bayman, I want to be a top five jockey. You're riding track work, 2002, this beautiful, lovely young lady rides past you at track work. Irish girl. Christine Walsh was her name, who now is your wife. Take us back to that morning. Uh, well, it, 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 that was a lovely story. Timing, was it? That was a lovely story and introduction, but uh, it wasn't in to 02 that I met Christine. Oh. She brought Vinnie Rowe over. Right. Uh, so, so Christine was uh, the track rider and strapper for Vinnie Rowe for Dermot Weld. And right of course, on. he came over as the number one uh, pick for the Melbourne Cup runners, mm. along with the companion media puzzle. Yep. Of course, uh, when they arrived, the head lad said, look, you'll be looking after media puzzle. Vinnie Rowe's the main one. I'll be taking over him. Mm. So she did all the gallops and all the work with media puzzle leading up to that famous Melbourne Cup victory. Oh, yeah. And I, as I said, I didn't meet Christine then, but she went back to Ireland and she'd planned a bit of a uh, trip to the US to spend some time over there. And having come to Australia, she loved it so much, she thought she'll, uh, well, she didn't know where to go, so she flipped a coin. So. <laughs> flipped the and coin to go back to Australia. Our life is the result of a f toss of the coin. <laughs> and you caught up so and. She came here and. Yeah. Uh, with a couple of friends and ended up riding out for Ron Quinton, who I was still working for consistently. I wasn't apprenticed at this stage, of course, but mm. um, yeah, this bright, bubbly, pretty young Irish lass caught my eye and fortunately she had a bit of a twinkle in her eye too and now I've got two beautiful girls together. When did you have the guts to ask her out? Where was the first date? First date was in fact on my birthday because <laughs> Uh, so it would have been 03, my th mm. 20, 23rd birthday, thinking back at it, geez, time yeah. goes, but mm. she said no a couple of times, but being my birthday, eventually I was able to talk her into it, and the rest is history, as they say. Did you go to a nice place? Did you put it on, or was it just you? Eat, no, we did go to a nice that? restaurant. Um, <laughs> I think I had mud crab or some sort of crab, because yeah. I thought, well, Went well, I'll it? see how messy I can get, and if she's still, if she's still keen on me after this, will be half a chance. So. And it was locked, locked in from that, from that first date. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Good on you. Yeah, we yeah. we got on well. And getting back to what you were saying before about, you know, as a young man, you know, a young jockey, you've got the success, you've got the, you know, you've got a fast life. You, you, you need stability, and that's Definitely. what Christine gave me. Great, and continues to yeah. most of the time. First group one, Bart Cummings always said, we both rode for him, uh, the first of everything's always the best. First time you experience it. When was your first group one? My first group one ride? Win. Win was Defire in 2004 in the Dooman Cup for Guy Walter. Guy Walter, Defire, what a great way for age horse he was. Did you ride him in his lead ups to it? Or you came? Uh, I had ridden him in the lead ups, yes. Uh, he'd. He'd run very well in a couple of Cox Plates. He'd won a George Main Stakes, I think, for memory, with Chris Munts. And I'd been working for Guy consistently since I came out of my apprenticeship. I saw Guy as someone who, who, who would give me the opportunity on a good horse if, I, if it came along. Uh, when, I, when I went to Guy, Chris Munts was riding to fire. Glenn Boss was doing a lot of riding for Guy, and he tended to have the inside running at the top horses, but I could see that Guy would give me the opportunity if I stuck it out, and he was a great mentor. Uh, he's someone that has been very influential in, in my life and my career, and Advice. I, I miss him dearly, but mm. uh, life goes on, but he was, he was instrumental in my development, mm. you know, as a young rider. Mm. What a horseman the late great Guy Walter was. Um, and tell me, uh, you were a freelance jockey because the big trainers you mentioned in Sydney have always dominated Waterhouse Hawks. Uh, the list goes on. Um, and you wanted to be a freelance rider. Guy Walter was one of those trainers you rode a lot for. I'm going to throw some trainers' names at you and who you've had a lot of success with throughout your career. We'll start with Guy Walter. Um, how would you define him? Uh, he's a gentleman. 
very thoughtful. Uh, wouldn't probably have the business sense Acumen. that would be required from a young trainer these days. Right. But he had the horse sense, and he had it all in his head, all in his own head. And I, I like I said before, I learnt so much from him. He was very calm, and. You know, it was interesting. I, I, so my apprenticeship was at Randwick, of course, with mm. Ron Quinton, and then as a senior rider, I started going out to the middle and riding for Rogerson, Cummings, Waterhouse. Yep. And I'd do that four days a week and go to Guy Walter and ride one day a week, and it was like going back in time. The, the pace that, mm. and it took me a long time to be able to cope with this, the slowness of how Gee. how Guy did it compared to how I was used to doing it at Randwick, but. What a horseman. Once I did get used to slowing things down, it was actually more natural for me as well. Yeah. So I learnt to bring that that steadiness and calmness um, to myself when I came back to Randwick and it's sort of not something I've ever really talked about. But it and helps you under pressure. Uh, I think so, definitely. Oh. Chrissy Lee's a great mate of ours uh, and in particular, in particular for your good self. He likes to put you on when he can and in particular when you're a younger jockey, Chris Lees. Well, his father was a huge supporter in that time when I... Maxie? Max Lees, when I outrode McLean. Uh, he, he was... Oh, look, he, he was my number one supporter. He, he yep. just continued to feed me uh, rides and winners. Uh, obviously, Chris had a lot to do with that as well, but at that stage, uh, Max was the man and... You know, that change over period of an apprentice uh, with with a claim, going through your claim, I had about eight months of my apprenticeship to go with no claim, uh, and he was a huge supporter of me at that stage, and when I came back from the six month suspension, uh, straight away, I think I rode a horse called Empire mm. in the shorts at Randwick, and that was soon after getting back from that six month suspension and gave me that black top winner and away we went so yeah and Chris is obviously a very close friend of mine has Just been like for years man, and and that support's continued throughout. Great trainer. Chris Waller obviously um, you know winks but uh, prior to that um, he's a different cat Chris and we love him for it and when I say that he's such a strategic planner. Yeah Chris is you know, talking about the business sense that Guy Walter may not have had, I think Chris has been a pioneer mm. in the business side of being a horse trainer. Mm. And he, as you said, he's a very deep thinker. He's very calculated in every decision that he makes. And sometimes uh, I'm on the beneficial side of those decisions and other times I'm not. But. Yeah. You know, I've learned a great deal from working so closely with him and I've been very fortunate to be in, a, in that position to be able to work closely with him because not many people are. And having worked closely with him for so long, I've, as I said, I've, I've learned a lot from him and I'm, I'm sure he's learned from me too. But it's interesting, the changeover, because it was sort of Chris Waller that sort of edged me away from going to Warwick Farm to ride for Guy Walter. And right. Uh, I was still doing my days at Randwick, but uh, towards that last couple of years of um, Guy's life, you know, I was sort of wasn't doing so much work for him. I was working more for Chris Waller, and yeah, right. And then that wow developed in the relationship not only with Winks but many, many other great horses. Outstanding. So Chris trains his horses to the second, right, to get the best out of them, get them to peak for those big races. What are his instructions to you as a jockey? I find that he gives more instructions in the lesser races. I think when it gets to the bigger races, he's more inclined to leave it to me. Right. Now, whether he thinks that I've got more of an understanding or I've put more effort into uh, how <laughs> more motivated should, should for the be big written. ones. But also when you get Fair to that too. when you get to that main event, mm. you've been with the horse, generally speaking, for the preparation and it don't, you don't just turn up on Epsom Day or Doncaster Day or Cox Plate Day and, you know, you know, there's been two to three months of preparation going into those horses and yeah. uh, and obviously usually you've been a pretty integral part of that preparation. So you understand 
uh, where the horse is at and how it needs to be ridden and how the race might be run. Mm. And I think, so there, to, in a nutshell, the less of the race, the more instructions he might give. Mm. But the bigger the race, he's more inclined to leave it to his jockeys. Just want to touch quickly on riding in Japan, winning Japan Cups and Hong Kong Derbies, big Group One races in those two provinces, countries. Um, how much does it improve you as a rider? How great an opportunity is it to get over there and compete against others? I don't think winning the Group Ones improves improves you as a rider. I think you know having the opportunity to go and ride those horses and those races. Um, is the fruit of a lot of sacrifice and hard work that's been put in in the years before. And I go back to when I won the, Defo the Doom and Cup on Defy. I got on the plane the next night to go and see Christine, who'd moved back to Ireland for because her visa had run out. Right. And I spent 10 or 12 weeks over there on a working holiday in 2004. And I spent the mornings riding work and the afternoons in the pub watching English and Irish racing. And that was when my eyes were really opened mm. to, you know, racing on an international stage. I think at that up until then, I, I was I'd been very cocooned in Australian racing, and yep. the and the with, without social media and the broadcast uh, facilities that we have this day and age, you know, you didn't re you weren't really aware of racing over, you know, mm. with the exception of Schwarzy going over and winning, yeah. winning at Royal Ascot, but even that was a Different. year or two after that but get, just getting back to the question that opened my eyes to international racing and my hunger to want to learn more and over the years I've spent time in England with Mick Shannon in 2007 uh, I did a summer in, in, in the UK riding for him which I had a great deal of su success I then went and took a contract in, I went back there in 2011. Yeah. I took a contract in Hong Kong in 2000. Yep. And Big difference. 13. I UK think. riding, Hong Kong riding. They ride a little bit. Two opposite ends of the spectrum. Hong Kong's a little bit more like Australia. Yep. But Australia's in between. We're a bit more relaxed, like England. Yep. Or we're, we're more faster pace in England, but not as fast as Hong Kong. But mm. Hong Kong is a place that really improves you as a rider because the horses are so close on the handicaps that rides make a difference. Yep. Whereas in the UK, Take a lot of the races are set weights anyway, yep. same as Japan. So uh, you really have to be on the best horse to compete. Mm. Whereas in Hong Kong, four or five horses can win every race. Mm. That's what makes Jack Burton and Joe Marira yeah. and what they've achieved there so incredible. No doubt about that. Huey, you're a big business. You're a big brand now, Hugh Bowman. How do, how, do you mix, how do you mix business with looking after your money and continuing to concentrate just on riding? You're a big business now, so I'll start with the money side, money side of things, the investments, the money that you're making to put away. Is that a challenge for you? Um, the way, to be brutally honest, the way I've really managed my finances is to put it all into my house, uh, my home because there might be better ways to do it, but I'm not really a financial guru. I do have people that help me, of course, but I've found that, especially with real estate in Sydney, if I'm paying off my, my home, uh, it's reducing the, 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 the debt, which I'm, pay I'm paying tax on the interest on that. So that, that's been a great way to improve or gain assets for, for me. Obviously, I put as much as I can into superannuation as well. Right. Uh, but, yeah, I've tried to keep it pretty simple and not tried to, right. um, you know, I'd rather focus on my riding mm. and my weight. Yep. I think being as big as I am and having to be so disciplined with my weight has mm. been, a, been one of the main reasons I've been as successful as I have. You've always got to evolve as a jockey and try and better yourself. Tell me about your training routine now. We see you on social media out there. Hugh Bowman in the gym, looking like a gymnastic champion. Um, how did this come about? Because uh, a lot of people, uh, punters, will look at a jockey and say they ride track work, they go and ride a horse all day. But to better yourself and improve, you've got to work on, on your body and get it strengthened. Uh, tell us about your training. I think you, you change as you get older. When you're younger, I mean, as you pointed out, I'm 39 now, so I'm certainly uh, looking at the back end of my career. I think I've still got five years still at the level I'm at. Mm. Uh, 
under my belt. But what do you do? What's a day in the but, gym for you? But my my vision, you know, when when you when you're a youngster starting off, you you want to be better than him. You know, there'll be always someone off coming yeah. through the groups or the ranks. Oh, I've got to beat him. For me, it was Mitch Newman when I was a. Uh, oh, yeah. When I was apprentice with Ron Quinton, mm. was Brian Carter in Bathurst, was Mitch Newman in Sydney, <laughs> and then I'll be happy they get a mention. <laughs> uh, and then after that, you know, I suppose as when I went into the senior ranks, uh, jockeys, I was, I was a little bit mm. in between because the, the jockeys older than me, Danny Beasley, Lenny Beasley, Corey Brown, they were three or four years older than me, yeah. and there was no one really at my age. So maybe that's why I've been able to win a couple of premierships. <laughs> Fair call. But, but, uh, give, us, give us your half 40 minutes, a 40 minute session and what do you actually do? Uh, well, that's evolved through my personal trainer, Trent Langlands, mm. uh, and he's been, he's been amazing in that I think he's just re, rejuvenated or reinvented how I think about myself. And, you know, like I said, as a youngster, you're thinking about being better than the next jockey, but I've found as I've got older, I'm not trying to be better than anyone else. I'm not trying to you know, outride, you know, I'm not trying to outride my fellow riders. I mean, I'm trying to be the best that I can be. Yep. And that's what the gym does for me. It makes me concentrate on myself mm. and be a better version of me. And then I can take that to the races and perform at a level that I expect from myself. He trains like a triathlete, that's what he does. Are you a good father? I like to think I Bambi, am. five years in age, four? Five, Bambi's five. Ba Page is four, so getting back to when I took that time off and was able to reflect on Winx's career, you know, I could see for the first time that, you know, for two, two to three, for, for a two or three month period in the autumn and the spring, uh, my thought process and my, you know, I, I was really, and a common question was how did I cope with the pressure of Winx? Well, I didn't see it as coping with pressure, but what I was doing, I was blocking it out. Right. And I feel as though I was blocking everything out. Mm. And I didn't see that until, until after she retired. And uh, although I was there for the kids, my, you know, you're at home, but you're not actually at home. Yeah. So, you know, I think my wife and my kids were, I, I wouldn't say neglected because it wasn't like I was neglecting them, but. I, I feel like... Played his second fiddle that, a little bit with Well, that, they also got shut out to oh, a degree, okay. yeah. along with everything else. And Interesting, mate. That's yeah. something that I don't want to happen again, and it's something that I'm glad I took the time off, and, mm. you know, I've been able to see that and so realise mental, it. Mental, physical strain on when Winx retired, the end of the 2018 season, you did take time off. 19. Uh, 19, sorry, it was. Um, and you just had to get away from it. I just had, I did. And I was physically and emotionally exhausted. And, you know, I was driving the races at Warwick Farm and I had I'd rides at the Gold Coast on Saturday. They were booked down. Mm. And I went, to the, I, went, I went for a run to lose the weight, as I do. And again, it's part of my daily ritual. That was the same when Winx was racing. It's the same if I'm riding the Melbourne Cup. Mm. It's the same if I go to Hong Kong and I'm riding the Hong Kong Derby. It was the same when I was in Japan. You know, that's what I have to do. So I'd go through my ro daily routine to get myself ready. Uh, for Wednesday, midweeks at Randwick, and I'm running up the hill at Coogee, and, I'm, and I was just gone. And usually when I'm gone, mm. I give myself an uppercut and I run a bit harder, yep. train a bit harder, wow. and I just stopped. I stopped in my tracks. I turned around and walked back down the hill. And I went home and I said, oh, I said, I'm not going to the races. So I sat on the couch for 10 minutes and I said, don't be weak, get in the bath. So I got in the bath, lost my kilo and a half, drove to the races, but I said to myself in the bath, today's the day. You cooked. I'm having a break. You and cooked. it's the first time since I've been, since I started in 97, that I've taken an extended break without either injury or suspension. We don't come with manuals, and the pressure of, of, of Winks, the press conferences, the building up, the 33 straight, the 25 Group 1 wins. Uh, we, 
I wish I had more time with you, Huey, but I've got to touch on on the mighty mare. She did retire in 2019, but if her, I want to touch on the four uh, Cox Plates, folks. We, we need to ask him because they're, they're great memories in sport and in our game, Thoroughbred Racing 2015. Winx's first Cox Plate, Criterion was your danger. Highland Reel, I believe, was the international horse in the race. You were pretty confident going into it because you'd had an outstanding Epson win leading into that. We had, so we had Preferment in the race as well, who I'd won the Turnbull on. Mm. And although it's easy to look back now and know which horse to choose, at the time it was a legitimate decision I had to make because I felt Preferment was beating better horses. Uh, I, let's be honest, the, Wink, the Winks as Epsom, as, although as dominant as she was, uh, was a, I thought it was a below standard Epsom that yeah. year. and. So my question mark was, was she good enough to go from, you know, three-year-old three, three year old filly to winning the Epsom, mm. a substandard Epsom, which we thought, to taking on high, the, your Highland Reels uh, criterions, world, world performed gallopers. Mm. And so we took, anyway, I thought, I thought Preferman, if he wins, he's going to win by nose. Mm. Winks could annihilate them. So we went with Winks and... Good decision. Wink, winks, winks, four, four and a half lengths, 4.7 lengths. I'll get it right. And we track record time. And track record time. We'll whip through them, uh, Huey. Um, your second Cox Plate. This was a match race between her and Hartnell. It was. What a build-up. I think it was, I think as a race it was my favourite. Right. Because of the build-up. Uh, and I'll, this day I was confident. The, 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 gallop in, the gallop on the Saturday before the race was probably the best gallop she ever put in. I thought she was going to go straight through the wall at the end of the straight. <laughs> and yeah, I was, that, I was supremely confident that day and it was only overshadowed that race by the roar of the crowd mm. in the fourth Cox Plate when she came around the home court. Really? You rode her pretty good too, like you just opened her up down the side. Like, <sighs> give her room. Yeah, well, but by then I had the confidence. I oh. knew she, Really, she couldn't be beaten. And the third Cox Plate, when when Humidor gave her a bit of a fright, uh, it looked she looked vulnerable. But again, it was track record time. She mm. broke her own track record that day. So ev all four Cox Plates uh, had something very, very special. See so a question mark there. Blakey Shin stays to the fence and sneaks up inside. She was only 0.4 of a length. Mm. She would have found though, wouldn't she? I think I was surprised but I wasn't threatened when I saw Humidor. I could sort of hear the crowd sort of mm. dull, or the noise. And I thought, anyway, I had a little peep and I saw him there and I, as I said, I was surprised. Mm. But I Ooh. didn't feel threatened. And I think she extended on when she felt his presence as well, so. Three ticked off. We're going for a record, a standalone record. Fourth Cox Plate. Ben Battles in town, Humidor's back. What was your lead up like and how confident were you on the day? I here? think I was more nervous uh, this day than any of the others. I remember playing uh, golf with James McDonald mm. on the, what, might have been the, fr the Friday before and yeah, I was, I was just really quiet, you know, I just couldn't yep. really control that emotion and I, I was just unavoidable, unavoidable. Yep. but on the day, um, I was right. On the day I felt supremely confident. I, st I, I make a point of not being superstitious. Yep. I always have. So <laughs> I was trying to put any superstitious thoughts I had to one side, like I do every other day, but I found that more difficult that particular day. Yep. But uh, yeah, look, it was, as I said before, the, the crowd eruption mm -hmm. when she came around that home turn was. Uh, was probably the highlight of my career. So Mate, far. I was there. I've never heard anything like it. I can tell you that now. Um, what are you going to miss about her the most, Winks, as we get into a 60 seconds with Simo coming up? Uh, I'm going to miss the track work because oh, yeah. that was the time when I was, was just me and her. Uh, Chris used to come over and watch her from the winning post. So it was, it was just like the three of us, the Tuesday morning gallops when there was no cameras, no nonsense. We just, it was just the three of us really. But... Um, you know, and I really got to feel that power and, you know, it wasn't there for show, it was just real and, you know, but on race day, there's so, by the end of it, so much other business came with it, mm. um, it was the track work that 
I really enjoyed the most. Unbelievable. Will, will we see another one like her? You can never say never because <laughs> I didn't think we'd see another horse like Black Caviar. I don't think anyone did, but within two or three years, Winx came along. So wow. you never know what's around the corner, Simon. You're a freak. You are. So is Winx. Huey, um, thanks for being the inaugural guest on uh, Special Delivery. We always finish with the 60 seconds with Hugh Bowman. It's going to be fast trigger questions with a quick answer. Um, I've got another half a page of questions here, folks. We've run out of time, though. Huey, you ready? Ready to go. This is a highlight of the uh, Special Delivery podcast, you know. All right. Okay, really quickly, and we'll start on the clock. And Hugh, if you could live anywhere else in the world, where would you live? Dunny do. What would you change about yourself if you could change something? Uh, well, I'm happy with who I'm. I'm happy in my own skin. Yeah. Uh, how would your friends describe you? I'd like to think they would describe me as honest. What's your favourite hobby? Golf. What's the best present you've ever given anyone? Um, my wife, her engagement ring. Tell us your pet hate. Uh, people that are impatient. If you could be a zoo animal, who would you be? <laughs> I'd be a monkey. Where do you see a monkey? Where do you see yourself in five years? Uh, like to think I'm in a similar position than I am now. What's the most daring thing you've ever done? Uh, skydived. What's your favourite karaoke song, Hugh Bowman? The streets have no name, although I can't sing it. Uh, and what was the last thing that made you nervous? Uh, a three-foot putt. Hugh Bowman, what is your legacy going to be at the end of your career? Uh, I guess it's not... It's a hard one to answer yourself, but I'd like to think that I, when I walk away from... You know, when I t retire from the saddle, I'd like to think that I've got the respect um, fr from my colleagues in the weigh room and, and the trainers that I ride for and the owners that I ride for, but to be seen as uh, a very fair jockey, a very uh, competitive jockey, uh, obviously we all want success, but yeah, I, I, to be fair, to be, to be recognised as fair. When the great man passes away, that's a lot to fit on your tombstone, but I like the answer. Huey, we always finish special delivery with a bit of a hug, mate. Thanks for joining us. See you, mate. It's been a pleasure, man. Good on you, mate. Thank you. Jeez. Good stuff. That's it.